Hi, I'm Michelle Adabato. The North Ward Center is committed to educating the public about the importance of community programs that give all New Jersey residents a chance for a better life. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Insurance fraud costs New Jersey families $1,300 a year. New Jersey State Nurses Association and the Institute for Nursing. Johnson & Johnson. The Northward Center. Adler Aphasia Center. Helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. Verizon. And by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You've got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. It is my pleasure to welcome a very distinguished gentleman. He is Kevin Callahan, professor of criminal justice at St. Peter's University and retired New Jersey Superior Court judge. Good to have you, Kevin. Thank you for having me very much, Steve. We are just talking before we got on the air that the field of criminal justice changed dramatically less, f I mean, five to ten years ago. Different, right? Absolutely. How so? It's all inclusive. It, people think, well, you're going to be a police officer. Of course, it's that, but it's much more. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we run the gamut of students who want to be lawyers, probation, correction. Uh, they want to be a sociological major at times with a minor. Uh, we have a very large... Uh, major, one of the largest in the university. Why do you think that is? I think, it, I think there's a lot of people that want to make a, the place a better place to live. And they think, a lot of my students think that becoming involved in the criminal justice system and the diversity that my school brings to mm -hmm. that uh, could make for better relations all the way around. And I've seen it over the last eight years I've been there. Uh, we now have many students that are on police departments and uh, state police and also law schools. And as you know, we're a very diverse school. And I think the more that people interact with other people, mm. the more tolerance there is. You know, I've been on your campus many times. Uh, President Gene Kanaki, a good friend, um, is actually former professor of political science. Yes, started as a professor and has been there for 35 or more years. And I remember lecturing a few years back at the Guarini Institute. Oh, yes. Uh, named after the, the Honorable uh, Congressman Frank Guarini. Gave me my start in law. He did? Yes, he did. I mean, I just happened to say that to disclose that I taught there one time. Well, when I graduated Seton Hall Law School and I did an internship, um, I'm born and raised in Jersey City, he was not a congressman at the time. It was before that, after he was a senator. Right. And uh, we met, we had met, known each other a little bit, and I was finishing a law clerk. Wow. Uh, internship, and he said, you want to come to my firm? And he gave me my start. I well, stayed with him for over four years. It's interesting how you're talking about uh, giving uh, one his or her start. The internship program that you have gives people the start, if you will, an opportunity to see things they otherwise or experience things they otherwise wouldn't, right? Absolutely. It puts them in the real world. As you know, we're, we're first generation. We have a lot of first generation students. And so uh, they're learning in the classroom with us, obviously and our experience that we give them professionally from prior uh, histories that we've had. But they don't really experience it from the inside. So with an internship, if a young man wants to be a defense attorney, I may send him to the prosecutor's office or to the public defender's office. If he wants to be um, a lawyer that uh, does trial work, I'll send him with a trial judge. If he wants well, to be- Well, what do you mean send him to the trial judge? They'd he'll, actually he'll be- He'll intern for the it... law secretary of the trial judge. Will they really uh, oh. get to understand the way a trial works and the role of a Really? They're sitting next to the judge oh trying God. a murder case. Really? In many cases. Uh, the judges are wonderful. Uh, they actually uh, report directly to the law secretary. They'll go, they'll watch sentencings, they'll sit in the courtroom and watch trials. They'll interact and see how a judge is, is you know, the fairness of a judge and how sure. they're 
uh, trying to make decisions, and they get comfortable in the system. What about police uh, work? Police are work. They in friendships, the, or is that tough? Uh, no, you know the New Jersey State Police are a wonderful force. We have a couple of interns there, uh, just finished or just starting. Uh, Jersey City Police Department, Elizabeth Police Department, Hudson County Prosecutor's Office, uh, Bayonne Police Department. They all embrace us, and, mm. and our students are wonderful ambassadors. They're learning, and they'll come back more, almost to a person. This is what I want to do, or. There was also a situation where, you know what, I thought I wanted to be in probation, but I really think I like parole better, or I really think but I But they get to it. see it. They're there. They're, they're, they're helping. They're involved. It's not just sitting there watching. They're actually engaged day in, day out. You know, the other thing that's interesting is um, for the people they wind up working for, the employers, are they better because of this? Are the students? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They're graded. Uh, Half of their grade or more is what the site supervisor thinks of their work. Right. And um, although, of course, in criminal justice, you would have to take civil service. You can't be directly hired. If it's we, the government. If it's the government. But we have had students that uh, have been hired uh, by prosecutors, the prosecutor's office. Uh, it has helped them when their resume, I mean, applying for the state police is that they intern there. Mm. Uh, and then they sit on their resume. Uh, so it does, it, it makes them human to the people that are making these you, you decisions. You know, Dr. Kanaki, Gene Kanaki, the president, was with us on, I think it was State of Affairs uh, a few months back, and one of the issues we talked about that I want to ask you about is, is the brain drain. New Jersey losing so many Absolutely. of our students um, to universities and colleges across the nation. They just, they're not here. They, they leave. What are you able to do in the area of criminal justice to keep them here? We, we give them education by people who have lived the life, retired state trooper, retired uh, head of probation, uh, myself who was on the criminal bench for years. We bring that dynamic plus the educational aspect of it. And they know that most of us mm. are first generation as well. And it, it inspires them to say, you know, I can do this. And that way we sure. supplement it with the real world of an internship and invariably uh, it, it, it really, formulates their desire and sort of, uh, solidifies their desire to sure. do Sure. Sorry for interrupting. Before I let you out here, uh, you served on the bench. I have to do this. The thing you loved most about being a judge was? Leaving each day feeling that I had done something that changed or shaped a life, be that the defense, the prosecution, the victim, or the defendant. And I was actively involved with trying to do something positive for the system, which, without a criminal justice system, we're chaos. And that's rewarding. Well said. Um, Kevin Callahan, professor of criminal justice at St. Peter's University, again, one of our uh, longtime supporters and partners, uh, and retired New Jersey Superior Court judge. Your Honor, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate it. Same here. We'll be back, back right after this. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Grace Kennan Warnicke is the author of a, a compelling book called Daughter of the Cold War. Good to see you, Grace. Good to be here. I was just saying before we got into this interview on air, you've led an amazing life. I have. And born mm -hmm. in Riga, Latvia. Yeah. yeah. And describe your childhood. My childhood is hard to describe because it was constant motion. It changed all the time. By the time I was 12, I spoke five languages. I spoke English, Norwegian, German, Portuguese, and Russian. Um, I never went to the same school twice till I was in the 11th grade. Because? Because my father was in the Foreign Service. Tell everyone who your father My father was a, later became a well-known ambassador to the Soviet Union, That's George right. Kennan who formulated the containment policy, which was our policy towards Russia, for over 50 years. Yeah. So it's interesting. You are an expert on and care deeply about U.S.-Russia uh, relations. I never considered myself an expert, but well, maybe you know I it well. am. I do know it well. Yeah. And why is, why is that relationship so critically important to not just the U.S., Russia, but the world? 
Well, because we're among the largest countries in the world, we're in that group. And for many years when it was the Soviet Union, Soviet Union was a very powerful and large country. And we were the two major, China at that point was just starting up. And That's they, right. they weren't considered part of the, the group, really. You went to public school in the Soviet Union? I went to public Soviet school Union. in Moscow. Describe that. It was a regular public school. Regular? Well, there were no other foreign children. The embassies did not allow them. It was wartime. It was just you. And we got there because our previous post had been Portugal. They couldn't get us back to the United States. So I was the only foreigner in the whole school, except for the daughter of a Chinese communist who seemed to live there full time. Mm. And when I started, I didn't speak a word of Russian. I was 12 years old, and I was just put in school. And um, the first day... At that point, it was a single-sex education, so it was all girls. The first day, they all shoved around me, put me in a corner, and lifted up my skirts because they wanted to see what American underwear looked like. Did they think that, what, 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 that, that really was, happened? Yes. Did I they would, think you were some sort of spy? No, they didn't. We were allies. It was oh, oh, you know, put that in context for us. Yeah. So Explain that This was us. a time when we were friends with Russia, very good friends. Because? And we were fighting the war against the Germans That's together. Right. That's right. It was, it was mutually it beneficial. Was mutually beneficial. When did it change? And I would go out whenever Stalin had a victory. They, they didn't celebrate. The West, Joseph Stalin? The Joseph Stalin. We would all be called into the main hall, and we would cheer for Comrade Stalin. And I was cheering away, too. Now, by the way, you had a Stalin connection. Stalin's daughter? I took care, ended Svetlana? up taking care of Svetlana Stalin when she came to this country. <laughs> yeah, just a typical life so far. Um, the, 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 the main message, I hate to ask it that way because the book is so complex and make sure you go check it out. What is the main message you want to get across in Daughter of the Cold War? Well, I have about three messages. Sure. I call my life an improvisational life. It was the most unplanned, unforeseen life. I grew up at a time I graduated from college when there weren't a lot of opportunities for women. I would have loved to have gone into the Foreign Service, but it wasn't, there were no women in the Foreign Service. And then I got married. I did the more tradition, had three children. And it was only when that ended that I started this long parade of jobs. And my main skill was that I knew the Russian language that I knew Russian, so it got me into, a, I, I went over there for television stations. I took Senator Kennedy did, did over to Did you help Ted Kennedy? Yeah, Senator Kennedy. I took Senator What did you help him do? Everything. I mean, we were, every day we were meeting people. I was translating. I was organizing. There you are on that shot right there. I'm looking at a picture of you and, Bre is that Brezhnev? Yes. <sighs> so there we were, walking down the halls of the Kremlin. That was very exciting. I interrupted. The other messages that you want to... Uh, Deliver here the book. Well, somewhat the messages of being a woman when it was difficult to be a woman. Sure. And another message that for some people they have very planned lives. They go to medical school, they become a doctor, that kind of thing. I went absolutely in the opposite direction. I zigzagged from pillar to post. I had a lot of adventures. In some ways, I would call this an adventure book. I mean, I ended up at the coronation of the king of Nepal and things you would never think of. I took Joan Baez to Russia. Well, what, what, how did that play out? Uh, what were you at Woodstock? I mean, in all seriousness, <laughs> how, do you, how does the Joan Baez connection happen? Well, she was quite serious. She was very to, political. She's very political, and she wanted to meet Sakharov. Really? That's why we. Andrei Sakharov? Yes, Andrei Sakharov. And I, we organized it, and I took her to meet Sakharov. Why so, you? Well, because I'd already met her because I'd found her a Russian song to sing when she was going to go over with um, the Beach Boys. They were going to do a big concert in Russia that got canceled. Right. And the music critic for the Chronicle happened to be a friend, and he said, would yeah. you find a song for Joan Baez? And that's how it all started. Yeah. Uh, one other person I want to ask you about, maybe two, Vladimir Putin. Well, I did. I'm one of the few people I met a half an hour alone with Vladimir Putin. What year? It was, um, I think, 92. KGB? Um, well, I knew he was KGB. Well, but, you knew. But he was deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. Oh, and really? I, was, I, had my, I started my own business consultancy firm, and I had a client who wanted something to do with a port of St. Petersburg. 
And I had a meeting with the real mayor, whose name was Subchuck. So I was thrilled. I was taking, I was going to go meet the mayor, discuss my clients, things. Mayor was out of town. Instead, they produced this rather small guy named Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. He didn't want to meet me. I think he was annoyed by having to meet with an American woman. And um, he didn't take me seriously. How can women be president of anything? What did you say about his eyes? I said he had the coldest eyes I ever saw. Coldest? They were really cold. I, at the time, I thought, my God, what if I was being interrogated by him? He would wow. really scare you. Uh, before I let you out, any thoughts on Trump, Putin, together? Well, who knows? I mean, I don't think you can predict either one. Scare you? Yeah. A lot or a little? Uh, I think these are, uh, these are tough times in U.S.-Russian relations. We're going through a difficult period. Yes, I'm scared. I thank you for joining us. Well, Do you mind if you. I tell folks about the book again? Yes. Daughter of the Cold War. A war, excuse me. Grace Kennan Wernicke. Thank you. Stay right there. Thank you. Now, when we come back, my colleague Joanna Gagas goes on location to Virtua in Voorhees, New Jersey, to look at the role that maternal fetal medicine plays in high-risk pregnancies and how more women than ever before are able to bring hope of starting a family to life. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. When Philip and Michelle first married, they had everything to look forward to, including starting a family together. But as the years passed, it became clear that their journey would take a different course. So it was a long time to be pregnant. We tried on and off for literally seven years. Um, it was parts of our lives that we were just going to give up. We were just going to say, you know what, we're happy where we are and let's travel. So we went to go give it one last shot. Um, and it worked, but it worked, but then it didn't work to perfection the fairy tale that everyone's looking for. It was early on in Michelle's pregnancy when she was referred to the maternal fetal medicine team here at Virtua, led by Dr. Shailen Shah. Like so many other women, she came here scared and unsure of what the future held, but hopeful that this pregnancy would end with the joy of new life. At 16 weeks, we got the first inkling that something's really off here. Baby B isn't growing the way that she should be. Baby A looks good. She looks great. Baby B, on the other hand, a little small. The 20-week anatomy scan. And, and you go home and you're like, just get me through the 20-week anatomy scan. Make sure that, you know, they have 10 fingers and 10 toes and everybody's good. And that's when the shoe dropped. And it was, we really need to monitor you. Maternal fetal medicine monitors patients with conditions such as obesity, diabetes, heart disease, women with preeclampsia, autoimmune or genetic disorders, and for age, women who are over 35, or like Michelle, who are pregnant with twins. How are you? The two most important things I monitor from the baby's point of view is the weight and growth of the baby. Because a baby that's growing well tells me that that placenta, the organ that delivers oxygen and food and nutrients from mom to the baby is functioning well. The other thing is the baby's movement, because that also tells me, just like us, when we're not feeling well or we're winded, we want to rest, we don't want to move. Babies are no different. So a moving baby tells me that the baby is happy. From the mom's side of things, I am alerted to if her symptoms outweigh what would be normal for a pregnancy. Of course it's normal for a pregnant mom to have some back pain or be winded, but it's not normal to be short of breath as they're walking from their car to the doctor's office or lying flat to go to sleep. Bleeding is another big issue. Usually spotting is innocent, but sometimes it's not. And it's not just heavy bleeding that can threaten a pregnancy. In Michelle's case, IUGR, or intrauterine growth restriction, was the reason why her twins were not growing the way they should be. We did have a scare where one of the things with IUGR is, does the blood flow stop? Um, even if it's for a split second, does the blood flow stop? And it, well, there was a visit 
where for a split second, her blood flow from the placenta to her, through the umbilical cord stopped. Um, and I could see it. And I remember looking at him and going, that's it, it's over. Michelle later learned that the blood flow stopped because she was in the middle of a contraction. But in that moment, she says she was devastated. I cried on Dr. Shaw's shoulder for probably 20 minutes and then was like, okay, we're gonna do this. And we came back and the blood flow wasn't great, but it was better. How did they deliver that news to you? How did Dr. Shaw, how did the team here tell you that? With a bit of sadness, but with a bit of compassion and going, this happens all the time. This is common, it's just not talked about. We're gonna be okay, you're gonna be okay. Maternal fetal medicine is, it's them. They're the patient, but mom's a patient too. And to have Dr. Shaw really make me feel like I mattered and answer any question from every medical journal that I might have read, we walked through it um, step by step. What did that reassurance in times of incredible stress do for you and your husband? It, it made you feel like you were a human. It made you not feel like you were a number, oh, I'm just one of you know 500 patients they saw today. Um, I mattered. My girls mattered. As my uh, a famous partner used to say, the neck up matters as much as the neck down, and no truer words could have been said. I treat patients like I would treat my family members. I talk to them in layman's terms about what's going on. I help them understand the physiology. And um, I tend not to tell patients what to do. I rather engage them. I'm certainly their advisor, and there's times I say, this is the right thing to do. But most things in medicine can be a discussion rather than a dictation. Michelle really wanted to understand the background, not just what we saw in ultrasound, but why that led us to the conclusions we did. So the more information I gave her, it empowered her to do better research. And it empowered her to ask me uh, better questions. Dr. Shaw believes that patients are very often the first ones to know that something is wrong. And he says they need to be their own advocates. Um, at 32 weeks, I just didn't feel right. I, I started to be really lethargic and really tired. I was itchy. I was super itchy, um, I was super tired, I was super swollen out of nowhere. Um, I just, I, I, it was just a totally different feeling that I had had. And then it was at that next visit when I was like, something's not right. We did some blood work, they took some liver numbers, they did um, a protein culture, and my numbers were through the roof. My liver wasn't functioning. At one point, my liver numbers were 10 times what they are on a normal level, which meant bile was backing up into my system. And it made, could make the kids really sick and, you know, God forbid, we could lose them. Um, and I knew, I knew, as much as I didn't want to believe in it, that these babies were coming at 33 weeks. I was out in the hallway with the doctor that was delivering and was, I was told to, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah was told is you may have to make a choice. So, because they have to go in and take the babies out right away, and I don't, we have to go now because, you know, your wife's liver levels are <laughs> 10 times uh, more than it's supposed to, and she may lose a baby, both babies, or we may lose her. And that one, still can't wrap my head around that one, still to this day. So very often women will come to you after they've seen their OBGYN after they're pregnant. You advise women who could potentially be high risk to come and talk to you because you may be able to actually help them before the pregnancy? Absolutely. I can be most effective preconceptually, both medically and optimizing their health and also from a psychological and emotional point of view, easing their anxiety or in those very few patients maybe suggesting that uh, we look at different avenues. Many times we can tell women that despite their high-risk condition, despite their lupus, despite their heart disease, that with proper management, they can have a healthy outcome. And that's exactly what happened for Michelle and Philip. They welcomed two beautiful baby girls that day, Peyton and Piper. They were three pounds and needed some respiratory support to get them upstairs to the NICU. It was scary and it, a lot of it's a blur, but I do know that I'm fortunate enough to have a, that picture, that, that first family photo of all four of us. 
we're just so lucky. We're just so blessed in the things that medical science can do and, and ensure that they're okay. You're just grateful. You just stare at them and you're just like, oh, look at luck. Or this could have been a much different situation, but it's not. I have two very healthy children that, yeah, there's stuff and there will be stuff. They were preemies and, you know, we fought a lot of battles throughout, but that doesn't matter. They're here and for all intents and purposes, they're healthy and they're amazing. Over the holidays, we, you know, we took a picture and they were happy and they were, you know, and I had to send it to Dr. Shaw and say, thank you. Because without you, I, this wouldn't be. This wouldn't be. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor, New Jersey State Nurses Association, and the Institute for Nursing, Johnson & Johnson, the Northward Center, Adler Aphasia Center, Verizon, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. How do you create change? By cultivating hope. And we see that every day. In the eyes of our preschoolers, in the souls of the seniors in our adult day program, in the minds of the students at Robert Treat Academy, a national blue ribbon school of excellence, in the passion of children in our youth leadership development program, in our commitment to connections at the Center for Autism, and in the heart of our community, the North Ward Center, creating opportunities for equity, education, and growth.